everybody and welcome back to another series of cup of tea with the vet um we have got joe fielder on today hi joe hi it's so lovely to have joe on she actually is the vet of the veterinary center uh Tarhurst veterinary center um but actually i was just we were just chatting because um our history goes back quite far because she was also working at a different practice um where we've had some mutual clients um so joe tell us about yourself oh my gosh okay well it starts quite a while ago um i've been a vet for 24 years um and um do you know i've just had lots of different careers within one lifetime which has been brilliant um, so I started off um, working locally in Sonning Common um, well local to us um, in Sonning Common as a, as a large animal vet mostly did a little bit of small animal but it was pretty much all cattle um, and then decided that I had the traveling bug um, so I actually worked in Indonesia for a year with oh, around wow on an orangutan rehabilitation center um, thought I had the traveling bug out my system came home tried to get back into small animal practice and just had a big carrot offered from a very big charity that work all over the world so went off for three years working for um, uh, a charity called the International Fund for Animal Welfare I4 they're kind of better known in the UK for banning fox hunting but actually globally do phenomenal work in all sorts of areas so I did a lot of primate work but bears and oil spills and marine mammal strandings and just everything. Had a, the most fantastic time and then got pregnant. So that all had to go on hold. Um, and I came back to um, to the UK and, and have been working part time as a small animal vet ever since. And that child, that baby is now 18, nearly 19. So wow. yeah, for 19 years, I've been working three days a week as a small animal vet in this wow. kind of area. Yeah. That's amazing. I had no idea that you had been off doing the orangutans and yeah. yeah. Wow. What's it like working with primates in other countries like that? Is it like little humans? <laughs> yes, absolutely. 100%. And I think orangutans, um, possibly more so because they're very, um, they're very gentle and they're very tactile. You know, if you're working with chimps, if you're going to do anything with them, you have to anesthetize or sedate them. Gorillas kind of 50, 50, whereas orangutans, I mean, you know, you can put um, IV fluids on and they'll just sit on your knee and have a hug while the fluids go in type thing. So um, very much more amenable. And they really were just, you know, just like working with little people. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. How cool. Give me a cool memory from back then. Oh gosh. Um okay, so um I think probably what one of the last orangutans that came into the center and we were going through names like there's no tomorrow um and it was kind of my turn to choose a name for this one. I called called him Justin, which is the name of my now husband <laughs> because we'd met just before I went out there. Um Oh and, wow. Um they're often quite traumatized, these little ones. He was about three years old um, and had, you know, lost his mum and been in, um, you know, horrible conditions in the back of someone's garden for a couple of years. And they're just desperate to hang on to something because they wouldn't leave their mum if they're in the wild. They'd hang on to their mum for, uh, you know, up to seven years. Um, just oh, venturing wow. little distances, you know, getting a little bit braver, but pretty much with mum the whole time. So you become their surrogate mother. Um, and he literally was attached to me for about 10 days and didn't let go at all, whether I was on the loo, whether I was having a shower, or anything. I had this little little ginger hairy person attached to me, so. Wow, oh, how wonderful. <laughs> oh my goodness me, that must have left quite an imprint. Oh I mean, yeah. How you, how, I was gonna say, how did you cope with all of this emotionally? Cause I know it's a real struggle when you see, you know, cruelty cases in this country. I mean. Yeah, you know, I, I yeah. Um, to be honest, I mean, I did, there's a big part of me that feels that um, I should have stayed there and devoted my life to them. But actually um, just being there for a year um, really, really broke me. It was really depressing. Um, it's such a, a dreadful situation that that just felt like there wasn't even a light at the end of the tunnel with the amount of deforestation. This is 1999, 2000. And you think, you know, we've only very recently become aware of things like palm oil um, and the plight of the orangutans as a result of all of the deforestation replacing everything with palm trees. But it was happening then. Um, yeah, and just, totally. Uh, and so Actually, corrupt. Yeah, I... I think that, you know, you're right to protect yourself and your mind for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, 
because I remember, yeah, I, I did my time at Battersea and I do say it like that. I did my time and mm. I feel like I really gave something amazing to those dogs mm. and cats that I helped. But emotionally, it's really tough. So, you mm. know, I feel good that I did it, but I had to leave yeah. it as well because you, you know, I've done you see so what I'm saying is you've done your bit and you should mm. be so proud of yourself yeah. for that. And but um, you could, don't you then just I live in awe of the women and the, the men, but I'm thinking of the um, the three you know, leaky women. So there was Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall and Baruti Galdacast. And it was Baruti Galdacast that I was working for. You know, that, wow. that did, they just put their entire lives on hold and dedicated themselves 100% to these primates. I just, you know, I thought it was quite a strong cookie. I, I couldn't do it. No. But they really then, are I mean, in regard to the uh, deforestation, I'll just tell you this bit because this actually blew my mind. And I think this is just a great thing to, um, to just give you some perspective um one of the guys I was over at the Isle of Wight and one of the guys who um I was at Osborne House and he was one of the gardeners there and he does a lot of um environmental stuff and he went over mm. to Brazil to discuss the deforestation over there and he said uh said back to our English guy he said well it's all very well and good you coming over here and telling us not to deforest everything you've already deforested everything and I was like whoa you don't yeah. consider that do you we've already yeah. ruined our country and then now on our high horses telling everybody else mm -hmm. to stop doing it which I totally agree of course you can't do it and shouldn't do it but it, you know also it's like yeah that's yeah you know, we've been bad too you know and um really so we've got to get better and we've got to sort ours out as well I mean I would absolutely love to be involved with reforestation and rewilding um and i'd love to do a kickstarter just to buy loads of land just to stick trees on it and stuff like that and um but you know got a dream about these things haven't we oh, absolutely but yeah i mean little dreams make a big difference sometimes don't they so they do at yeah. least the, the seed is planted excuse the pun <laughs> oh that's really lovely to learn about you so i mean oh, god so what do you like to do in your spare time i feel like playing with orangutans <laughs> yeah no god i wish i wish i just i yeah i mean it was so remote it literally i think it took me four days to get to the location of the the center complete planes trains and autobus i'd love to go back i really really would love to go back something that um i mean i'd love to take my kids i've got three kids now um but something we did do um a few years ago there was one of these imax movie things um and it was two um uh, two rehab centres. One was Daphne Sheldrick's Elephants in East Savo in Kenya, um, and the other one was the Orangutan Foundation in um, in Borneo. And we went, and you can imagine sitting in this IMAX theatre, like surrounded. And the kids looked at me throughout the entire thing, so I was just sat there in floods of tears, like watching. And some of the orangutans that had arrived as little babies when I was there were being released back into the into the national park. It was just. Oh my God, I really felt like, you know, they, they had a bit of an experience and a bit of part of it, but that wasn't the question you asked. Um, so I used to row oh, um, years ago when I was at university, I was a rower, which brought me down to, um, so I live in Henley. So I moved down here because that was like the, the center of the universe for um, women's rowing at that time. Um, yeah. But I don't row anymore. Um, now it's kind of, I don't know, I did quite a bit to keep fit running and stuff with my dog and um, those kinds of things but you know when you're a mum to three kids it's like what do you do in your spare time what is What's that spare time? <laughs> I don't know. I, my spare what? time is always like <laughs> after bedtime so you're knackered oh, yeah. and I have to try and keep myself going so I do understand completely yeah. um Lying in the dark room yeah rocking <laughs> <didn't they? laughs> so do you really miss the rowing though because it sounds like you were really yeah. dedicated um yeah I was I kind of you know dabbled ish for about a year and a bit with the GB squad but they kind of thought they wanted me and wow. then decided that they really didn't and and actually um I decided so it was this is, I'm going to show my age it was just when lottery funding was coming in so if you wanted to be an elite athlete then you gave up work and you looked for lottery funding and I thought I've just spent eight years university because I did a degree before my vet degree I've just spent oh, eight wow. years university training to do something I'm actually quite passionate about I don't want to give it up for something which, you know, I may or may not be particularly good at. So I just kicked it in. Oh, wow. And I, wow. I've, I've been in a boat like three times since then. So, so <laughs> definitely first, congratulations, because nobody gets yeah. to that stage without being absolutely awesome. And that, I think, needs to be commended. Um, I hope you go and have a good go at rowing at some point, because, you know, there must be 
other groups that you can join and I'm going to say this without trying to say Sorry. It's, it's just a huge commitment and I know that I'm kind of like an all or nothing person if, I, if I'm if i doing something I've kind of got to really commit to doing it um, that's what I was going to say I could tell that when you said it's a huge commitment it doesn't have to be Jo <laughs> <laughs> I know there's, there's veterans groups for everything oh god um, yeah no totally yeah absolutely exactly so you yeah. know you can enjoy it still that would be absolutely mm -hmm. amazing because you you shouldn't I was just you, I had no idea I mean that's amazing to be that level of rower that is really quite incredible so it, it's what kept me sane at vet school I have to say you know when everybody I'm else surprised. was um in the library I think um we we were given like block release just before our finals and literally the rest of the year lived in the library um and I had um a rowing partner who was at University of London. So I moved down to London and was rowing. Yeah. And I can remember very vividly, it was like the Friday morning and our exams were gonna start the next Monday. And we were doing like set pieces, timed pieces on some random dockland in East London. And I got halfway down the course and just thought, what the hell am I doing? I shouldn't be here, panic. And literally we just kind of, crawled to the side of the Docklands and my coach picked me up out of the boat, put me in the back of his car and drove me to the train station. He's like, I'll see you in two weeks, it's fine. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, well, that's nice and understanding. What was your, what was your degree before you did your veterinary degree? Um, I did biology. Hmm. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I actually didn't think I was smart enough to be a vet. Um, so 24 years later, that shows them. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I did the wrong A levels as well. So I, you know, I, I, I loved horses when I was growing up um, and just thought, you know, I was going to be, I don't know, the next eventer or something for GB. So GB oh, wow. thing. And, um, and then you kind of have this crashing realisation that you're probably going to be a groom for the rest of your life. Um, so yes. then I was just like, oh, I'm going to stay on at school and do the A-levels that I like because I don't know what else to do. And yeah, I did geography with biology and chemistry, so no vet school would touch you with that. Um, no, because that is yeah. weird. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. And then I was thinking, well, what do I do with biology? I don't want to teach. I don't want to be in research. So... Um, my mum used to be the um, bookkeeper at uh, Vets in Windsor. Um, and I got wow. some and thought, actually, I quite like this. I can see myself doing this. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's amazing. Wow, I that's think I was really about lovely. the only person on my vet course that wasn't born with the notion that they were going to be a vet. <laughs> no, I have spoken. This that's why I really like you know, chatting to all these vets is because I find out all these things. And you are definitely not the first vet to tell me that you didn't think you were going to make a vet. That is very common. And mm -hmm. um, and other vets have definitely found their groove later. Um, mm -hmm. I had one vet who was an accountant before being a vet. Wow, that's Gosh, quite a change. That is, and that's that's a lot of training because accountancy is quite a few years, isn't it? Well, I think she wasn't like a full on accountant. She was like, oh. um, but, you know, working along that zone. Um, and I can't remember the exact job title that she had, but sort of that that sort of ilk. Yeah. And I was like, that is quite a swing. Um, grew up with all the whole animal background stuff, you know, but yeah. just didn't, you know, didn't realise that veterinary was her calling. And it absolutely is now because she runs practice and loves it mm -hmm. and very passionate. So, um, you know. You know, just the point is, you don't have to always know what you want to do the minute you yeah. quite come out of school. And I think it's always really important passing that on as well, because then people realise that actually they're not a failure if they don't know what to do at age 20. And it's OK to change your mind as well. You know, 25 is still young. I'm saying 25 jokingly. I know people yeah. that have become vets at 40, you know, yeah. and um, I do think it's a, perhaps after that, you might be not perhaps so worthwhile because you've got 10 years doing the job. <laughs> But, um, you know, it's I do know people that have done it. So, you know, not impossible at all. And you should yeah. definitely fight for your dreams. Guys that you are watching, thank you so much for watching. And please do remember to get involved. If you want to ask questions, please do just pop them in the comments and I will pick them up and um, get them to Joe. So. <clears throat> So, I mean, what what was it that finally kicked you over into the It was you said it was because your mum took you to the bookkeeping at the vet. So you just saw what people were doing, and then that made you think, mm -hmm. "Oh yeah, I can give that yeah. a go." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you do some work? I mean, experience? We'd always had, you know, we'd always had lots of pets. I'd had, um, you know, lots of um, you know ponies that I was involved with growing up, and finally convinced my parents to let me have one when I was about thirteen. I, <laughs> nice. I think it's because I finally wound them down. I'm sure they probably took one look at this teenage daughter and thought right what can we do to keep her safe and off the streets <laughs> that's true 
Oh, but to be honest, that is um, going to work well. Nothing better yeah. to do than you have to yeah. do the pony all the time. Yeah. So what's your favourite part of being a vet? The variety. I think I think genuinely the fact that it's given me um, such a such a varied um, career, you know, because I've been I've been a manager. I've been a small animal vet. I've done large animals. I've done horses. I've travelled. It's enabled me to um, to work part time as a as a mother. Um, you know, I, I, I genuinely it's just been a phenomenal career. It's it's hard. It's tough. I think it's tougher now than it ever has been. Um, yeah. I'm sure being slightly older and slightly less energetic probably doesn't help but I do find it very exhausting now um because it's it's really high demand um but yeah it's it's the the variety that I think yeah. is the best for me yeah no, um, and it is the, the variety on a day-to-day -day basis you know it's such a, a a challenge and every I mean now every 15 minutes it's something something different you know something new walks through the door um that's going to really test and and challenge you um, and you just meet some fabulous owners and some fabulous animals along the way. So. Definitely. I've just, my last patient, squishy all over my facey. Oh. And uh, the, yeah. they bought me a card, and um, which is very kind, and she put it in her dog's mouth, and the dog went, here you go, and dropped it on the floor oh. and totally set me up for a fall, because as I bent down to pick it up saying thank you, <laughs> I was like, oh my god, you booby yeah. trapped me on purpose. And yeah. uh, everybody laughed quite a lot, <laughs> which is fair enough. Oh, that's funny. But, you know, I think it's um it's um it's a real privilege actually to have the relationship that we do with a lot of our clients as I well. Agree. And they really become, you know, a very critical part of some people's lives and families. Um, yeah. And um yeah, I, I actually I really enjoy and have probably grown to enjoy that side. Um, of the job a lot more um, as I've got older um, you know to be able to help and guide them to try and make the right decisions for what you know they justifiably feel is a really valuable part of their family totally yeah. and I, I you've nailed it as well and it's really good to have you say that as well because I think you know certainly over the years that's the one thing that I have grown to know is how much anyone just wants to know that mm. you care and that's mm. it and you know and that you're helping them make the right decision for them individually mm. as well um so yeah that's that's really great I mean everybody watching this is just going to be so thank you Joe. <laughs> um so yeah that's that is really lovely so what pets have you got now um i have just one dog um who's um, somewhere but she's not here at the moment so i've got um i've got a wirehead vizsla um and she's 12 and a big bit um but still going phenomenally strong um i've actually just decided in the last few months that she really can't come running with me anymore but she'd still be kind of game for it and you think seriously it's like running with your grandmother <laughs> Well, I know. So I actually, I did a marathon and I used to take my dog out and um, it was hilarious, really, because he used to go, no, <laughs> not coming. And uh, and I, I built it up very slowly, all very carefully. He was young, perfectly able to cope with it. And it was hilarious because I'd run at my mum's so where I didn't need to take him on the lead. So um, yeah. so he could make choices. And I used to always run up and down the same road that I knew was a, a mile and a half like to do. Oh God, so then like I knew. But I knew then how far I was going each time. So boring. But mm -hmm. I, I knew for my marathon training, I could um, check it out. And uh, I'll never forget the time. I can't remember how many laps we'd done at this point. But he was perfectly capable of it. And um, and he got back to the bridge, which was the closest point to where we stopped doing the lap and just go home. And he just ran home. And he yeah. didn't run home like all the way home. He <laughs> ran slow <laughs> enough for me to always be behind him going, Logan, Logan. Yeah. No good. <laughs> and um and he's just like, I ain't coming back. I'm going anyway. <laughs> and yeah, so um, when you get your running shoes out and put them by the door and they go, I'm oh, just gonna go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So it got to the stage where I realised that I had to just sort of put the running lead if I did it at home or, or wherever I was going. I'd just, you know, do a small amount and come back home and then leave him and then go out for the rest of it. So, you know, luckily for him, I've not done another marathon since. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that was helpful. But yeah, that's nice. What do you do competitive, like running or anything like that now? Or do no, you just, don't. No. Just yeah, just, just for the sake of it. That is fair um, enough. I've done um, a couple of like these ultra things, but walking rather than running. So this summer, um, my friend and I walked around the Isle of Wight without did stopping. Did you? Wow. How long did that take you? Uh, 21 hours. 
21 no. hours, 21 hours. Just, well, like we, we just did it in slightly less than 21. It was like 20 hours and 55 or something crazy. Did you yeah. stop and rest or did you oh. just do the whole thing at um, once? Well, it was an organized thing. So they have like every, um, every 25 kilometers, they have like proper rest stops with, you know, like hot food and stuff. And then like smaller stops um, halfway in between each of those. So yeah, in theory, you kind of have a bit of a sit down every 12 and a half K. So, but it was no sleep in that. It wasn't like a go to bed and then start again in the morning. No, no, we just did it straight through. I love the Isle of Wight. I've mm, never you wouldn't if you walked it. <laughs> I'm, uh, it's blowy. It's not isn't to it? put anyone off. <laughs> I mean, the wind resistance is quite significant. <laughs> All the trees in the Isle of Wight go like this. Oh, they, they do, yeah. And yeah. that's what always it makes me laugh. Day, actually, we were really, really lucky with the weather, so it was, it was perfect. Wow. And all over it, because when you're at Black Gang Chai, normally the weather's really bad there, no matter what. <laughs> and so it's it's a high part at the bottom. So I, I really oh, okay. that. yeah, that was beautiful. Where yeah, we did that in the in the day. So we start at like six in the morning or something. Okay. Something. Um, yeah, I just went right the way through. But that was like middle of the day. Was down that end. Oh yeah, of course you see them and doing it, some of it in the dark. That's a bit scary. Going to bobble off the side of a cliff. <laughs> No, no, so we were, uh, okay, and I can't even remember where we were, but it was, it, it was like, I I just remember it being quite flat and low at that point. Oh, wow, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, you have to have a head torch and you're supposed to be in groups and stuff, but, yeah. You've inspired me, Jo. I might consider this. <laughs> yeah, you should. The other one we did was um, the Thames Path. Um, okay. So we walked from, like, uh, Putney, to Henley, actually, it finishes at Henley. Oh, wow, and how long did that take? In slightly less, like 20 hours or something, I think. I don't I can't remember. But, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, I'd consider that. I think it's just I love the Isle of Wight. So going back there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit hillier. A uh, lot. Yeah. But actually, I feel like hills, hills are better. I think when you're walking on the flat all the time, your feet and your legs get more knackered, bizarrely. I think you kind of need to break it up a bit. Yeah, I think, yeah, probably mentally. Uh, yeah, I mean, it must be pretty to look at no matter what, really. As in, mm. Thames Path is pretty as well, isn't it? But, um, yeah. yeah, you've got me thinking now. That's it. My uh -huh. head's in thinking land now. I like doing little challenges. A little. <laughs> little. How rude is that? <laughs> it's not little. That's That sounds really cool. So um, I love asking this question. What is What of being a vet still grosses you out? Because I just think there must be something maggots are you really a maggot hater I hate maggots. you pass them over to the nurses <laughs> no do you know i'll make myself do it but it's it's definitely my least favorite thing i think there's a certain aroma that you get when you've got fly strike and yeah i think i think it's just seeing the multitude of little crawling things so we're we're, we're talking fly strike on rabbits usually sometimes cats sometimes sheep back in yeah. the day um and it, it's yeah it's, nice. it's, it's it's just grim and you just oh my god your heart bleeds for this poor animal that's literally having its skin eaten alive i know it I mean, is... you know in theory they use them right you know in the old days but i think they actually still use them now to clean up dirty wounds and you're like i i, I don't get that because whenever i've seen them they're just eating through everything <laughs> Healthy i agree no, i don't not, know how it works i don't right. know how it works but i know that they do do that i mean it is a bit bonkers when you put it like that isn't it so I do know that they do do it um mm -hmm. my friend in Germany tells me that they quite frequently like that's quite a normal thing over there um yeah it's not un normal here and I know that people mm. have people farm it. them on purpose yeah. keep them like so they're, they're clean maggots <laughs> so to speak <laughs> you know yeah for doctors you oh no that 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 honestly is just about it you know all the bodily fluids and it's the sound of them as well isn't it you can hear them fine you can hear them i actually quite enjoy doing a demagger i must admit i find it quite satisfying <laughs> obviously i feel for the animal completely it's just that you know <laughs> oh bless you that's it now you're set up for a nightmare tonight aren't you um so what would your dream achievement be if time and money was no object? Oh my God. Do you know, it? Um, 
I think I'd probably have to go back to my small ginger friends over in Indonesia. I thought you were going to say that. Leave a massive piece of rainforest that you can just release them into. Yeah. Ever after, and it would never burn down or <laughs> get chopped down. I know. But you know, Christ Almighty, how do you how do you achieve that? Well, well I, I didn't ask you how to do it. <laughs> I oh, know I did I left a big a big part of my heart out there that yeah that is very understandable now yeah. we've got a we've got a maggot comment come up um Paula has said I'm not a drama queen but I'd rather lose my limb than ha than have maggots in my in the room <laughs> Paula <I'm with> you. <laughs> there you go it's yeah. fair enough yeah you've got definitely. everybody agreeing <laughs> thank you for that Paula um <laughs> So tell us, can you tell me something that people don't know about you? Um, well, there's things that some people know, but not everybody. Uh, I'll take that, but only if it's good. <laughs> um, oh, my God. This is me not preparing my questions, wasn't it? Um, right. We sent you so, them in advance. I love seeing the squirming. It's all good. I'm, at least I'm not responsible at this stage. <laughs> well, I don't tend to bang my drum very much. But from a rowing perspective, um, I did set a world record. Did you? Oh, my God. That's amazing. It only lasted for three months. <laughs> only? It doesn't last for 10 seconds. Months. That's, congratulations. How much did you smash it by? And what was it? Tell us details. Oh, God, do you know, I don't, um, I, I honestly don't think it was by that much. It was, um, so basically, um, I was in a lightweight women's pair and um, we went to the national championships having been just deselected as the pair for Great Britain. And we were really angry. Um, and we went and of course record for the national championships, which still holds. So we still have the fastest time in um, it was because it was always at um, in Nottingham, and it's not in Nottingham anymore. So we've still got the course record for Nottingham, um, and yeah, we we set a world record. But then um, there was a, an amazing Australian pair that year, and then they went and broke the um, the world record again at um, the uh, world championships. So wow. <laughs> that was a big one. That was a lot of anger. Oh, <laughs> anger is sometimes the best. Sometimes if you get over rage, I've had this sometimes, that almost doesn't help because you are so angry um, that you kind of can't even focus. Um, but a good amount of rage to throw into something is quite impressive. I use it at gymnastics sometimes. Um, oh. <laughs> sometimes you're told to picture someone's face on the springboard. Really? <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's how you vault, right? Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah rage is used um wow mm. that's absolutely amazing i'm so i'm so impressed i'm <laughs> i mean have you got a certificate from like guinness or anything like no. how does it work no oh. no no it's just just a little bit of pride that sits on that shoulder every now and then as but as i don't as let as many as people see it <laughs> this is why i said you should go back to rowing because i just think oh god just no i'm far too old now and crumbling and knackered no, but not <laughs> For the sake of having to do world records. Oh God! You know? Okay. <laughs> I live in Henley. There's like you know an, an amazing stretch of river that I can almost see from my window. Do you do paddleboarding? Uh, yeah, I like paddleboarding. Um, I actually found windsurfing a few years ago as well. That was really cool. But I went windsurfing um, on Bray Lake, which is like not far from where I used to work. Um, back in the day, right, as a vet, when you would, because you start early and finish late, you'd have like two hours or three hours off in the middle of the afternoon. I used to go windsurfing in my afternoons when I was at work. Now wow. I'm lucky if I get time to make a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, that, but anyway, um, and it was January in the UK, windsurfing, and my hands got so cold that I, I literally, it was the most agonizing thing. I think it was colder and more pain, more painful than giving birth. That's the perspective. I literally went went through the 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 crying, screaming phase to the to the actually wanting to vomit phase. I just thought, never again. That's it. I'm never windsurfing in the UK. Doing it? Never again. Why did you just go? I going in now. I know. I know. I know. I think you know when you're doing it. 
you, you, the, you lose the sensation and then it's gone, right? It's only when it's coming back that it's just like super, super painful. <laughs> uh, to be honest, like cold and water are the two like hated oh. things in my life. So, you know, I like pedal boarding, but I'm terrified of falling off and I don't want to be cold or wet. And so, um, yeah, I, I would have gone in. I wouldn't have gone it out, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Paddleboarding can be really tricky. I remember taking my daughter paddleboarding and it was really windy and she literally just got blown into the reeds and couldn't get out of the reeds for about three hours. <laughs> I kept towing her out and she just kept pushed back in. Do you know, I nearly, I, so I, I, that's funny you say that because that nearly happened to me as in going in that direction. But I was like, whoop, 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 don't go in that direction. And I got out of it. But I did think what would happen if I ended up in there. Now you've told me. Great. Now you I'm going to be terrified. For days. Oh my god! I can't believe you've done that. You would give Hannah Capen a run for her money. That's that's insane. Um, so I, I have to ask: Have you seen the um, the Red Bull Extreme windsurfing? Oh god, no, 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 no. no I no. don't know that I should I'm share. Not that good at <laughs> no, but you should, you should Google it. I like have a watch um, because it's absolute madness. They actually have a safety team because obviously it's dangerous. This is really dangerous. I don't want anyone to copy it. It really <laughs> shocks me. This is so dangerous. It's untrue. And the thing is, Rain Red Bull always does dangerous stuff, but normally it's so oh, unachievable yes. you wouldn't even try. But this one kind of shocks me because I think there are some people that would just be this crazy. They'd just try it. Um, they go out in extreme weather. It's extreme mm -hmm. weather windsurfing. So they're going out mm -hmm. in nuts storms. They've got a massive safety team with them. I don't know, know how it's safe enough, to be honest, but that's what they do. Um, mm -hmm. I saw the video. I was just like, you are nuts. And they've got to have been painful. Because you're right. When you hurt, when it's cold, mm -hmm. all that hurts. And then they're oh, like, oh, no, just put some marigolds on. That will help. Thermal yeah. marigolds, maybe. But not your genuine thin rubber. Really? No, that's not good. I mean, oh God, crazy. When I moved to the Caribbean and set up my clinic, that could be my my lifetime achievement, couldn't it? That would be an amazing one. Cayman Island. <laughs> that would be very cool. I was <laughs> going to ask, my next question is, what is the most spontaneous thing you've ever done? I feel like it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, to be honest, probably, um, probably taking um, that voluntary position in Indonesia, with your oh, rank I think my then boyfriend, now husband, um, didn't expect for me to get, uh, I mean, I'd spent literally um, a year plus, maybe 18 months writing to loads and loads of, you know, projects all over the world, trying to get to volunteer with something. And I was just like, I can't understand that I, you know, I'm a qualified vet, I'm coming for free. I, I'd do anything that it took 18 months for somebody to go, yeah, all right then. Um, and literally, I think it was one week and I got like three or four offers in one week and, the next week I'd gone and I think he was a bit <laughs> hang on a minute where's she gone <laughs> you know I actually I actually do hear that from quite a lot of vets that try and volunteer for stuff um mm -hmm. RSPB was one of the most shocking ones because that's only in the UK and um one of my friends um that I was working with she wanted to be a volunteer vet for them and she couldn't get her foot in the door and she said yeah. um apparently had so many volunteers I was like really unbelievable yeah. so yeah I, I think that actually um you vets are quite good at volunteering is what I get from yeah. that. So, yeah. um, which is a good thing. That means I it's, think you know, it'll happen again. I think, um, I think I'd quite like to, you know, I've got, you know, two, two of my kids have, have now left home. So we're down to the last you one. You kicked two out. I've just got one more to go. So, you know, I think actually there's, um, there's a, there's some more volunteering in me. I'd like to, I'd like to do more charity work, whether it was VSO, voluntary services overseas type stuff. But I think a lot of that is equine and um, and livestock. But it was only 20 something years ago. The last time I looked at a cow, I'm sure I'll be fine. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so get the textbook you... back out. Say that bit again, sorry. Get the textbook back out. Oh, bless you. Don't, don't, don't blow your head right now. <laughs> Um, so do you want to um, tell us a bit about your practice that you're in at the moment and, um, you know, plug anything that's going on there at the moment? Yeah, so um, I, well, we met when I was clinical director for um, uh, the Pines in Maidenhead. Yes. Um, and I was in Maidenhead from 2004, 2003. 
right the way through till 2012. Um, and then um, for the last seven years of that, I've been clinical director there, um, but decided that I really didn't enjoy the management role, that I just wanted to be a clinical vet again. So um, moved over to, to Talhurst, which is where I am now, but we're all owned by the same big, um, big group. So we're kind of, you know, sisters, if you like sister practices. Um, and yeah, so Talhurst is, um, I think it's supposed to be four vets, um, but that doesn't often happen. It's happening a little bit more now, which is really good. Um, it's just small animals, so mostly cats and dogs. Um, we do quite a lot of work with the Reading Rabbit Rescue, who are part of the RSPCA, so do see quite a lot of rabbits and um, other small furry bits and pieces, but no orangutans, sadly. <laughs> I was going to um, say, um, you, can, you don't want it to. <laughs> um, you don't want it to, but obviously it's not great for the orangutans. No, no. No, and there's no there's no zoos in Reading. If Reading had a zoo, I'd be there. Oh, oh. totally, totally. <laughs> They've got the wolf place, haven't they? They have. You I don't know who they use. They don't use us actually, so I don't know who. You'll have to find out. Do you do your do your plugging to there? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know who they use. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's lovely. So yeah, I, 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 yeah I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy it. I do um, acupuncture on a bit of a side thing as well, um, which is lovely. Done. Um, yeah. So, gosh. Okay. So my current dog is twelve and a half, um, and my previous dog had really awful spinal disease. He had spondylosis, but ankylosing spondylosis. So basically, from his shoulders to his pelvis, his spine completely fused at eighteen months of age. Um, and it's really unusual. Um, he was a pointer and it's never been reported in pointers before and medication did nothing for him at all. Um, and I took him to have acupuncture with a chap in Beaconsfield um, and it was like I flipped a switch. He was just so much more um, pain free. Um, and really managed it really, really well. So I thought, you know, God, OK, rather than, you know, be driving over to Beaconsfield once a week. I'd learn how to do it myself, so I went on some some courses and um, and yeah, it maintained his um, his pain management. Um, unfortunately, at six, um, he then became paralysed um, oh. as the spinal condition deteriorated. But you know, it um, it definitely kept him going more than anything else. So um, yeah, so I'm really quite passionate about it. I'm not doing anywhere near as much of it now in Tilehurst as I used to in Maidenhead. I used to do an awful lot in Maidenhead. Um, it just doesn't seem to have really picked up quite so much, um, which is a shame. Um, it is a shame. It is really good yeah. stuff. It is mm. it is really good stuff. I it, quite a few of my patients go and have acupuncture as well, and I know mm. quite a few um, acupuncture vets, and it's incredible. And you always hear the same mm. thing, which is really wonderful. So um, yeah, well worth a try. And yeah. that leads me next very nicely to my lovely next question of what do you love about physio? So. As an athlete, I think I probably really appreciate the strength of physio. I've had a lot of physiotherapy over the time, you know, with either nursing injuries or just trying to use it in a preventative manner to stop yourself from getting injured in the first place. Um, but I've just really seen the power of it, and I've used it a lot in conjunction with the acupuncture as well, not only for chronic pain management, but for post-op recoveries and for diagnostics as well. Um, so, you know, sometimes particularly with soft tissue injuries and we can't really identify, you know, exactly what the injury is, then I'll often, you know, get a physio involved in, in helping me to make the, the right diagnosis. Um, if we know that, you know, we haven't got joint disease, there's nothing obvious on x-rays, um, just to have an expert pair of hands, because I think you guys are so much more used to, you know, manipulating and understanding muscle um, than we are. It's a little bit like, you know, if you've, as a person, hurt yourself, if you go to your GP, you're probably not going to get an awful lot out of them other than go home and rest and take anti-inflammatories. Whereas if you go to a physio, they're going to have a much better understanding of exactly what you've done and how best to help you recover. So, you know, I, I think that I hope that the day of the arrogant surgeon in the veterinary world is really at an end. Um, I think we see it both with you know, with, with human surgeons and with veterinary surgeons that it's not just, you know, the surgeon has done their magic and you are fixed. That's just the start of the healing process. And that process is better guided by a good physiotherapist. So true. And thank you so much, Joe. You explained it all so eloquently, eloquently there. That was absolutely lovely. And yeah, you're absolutely right. And definitely worth it, you know, pointing out because the 
you say from a human perspective, you know, any sort of aches and pains, you just get sent straight to the physio. And mm. I've been sent to the physio so many times. And, um, you know, and it's always really interesting that, you know, it's literally their first port of call. So, um, yeah, absolutely right. And, was, you and know, I think I think there's so many vets who feel that they have to be everything and they have to know everything and they have to be they have to be the dentist they have to be the gp they have to be the surgeon they have to be the medic you have to be and do you know you just don't you know and it's okay to know your limitations and know when I agree. You know, I, there's something wrong i don't know what it is so we need to pull in on expertise from other areas to to try and work totally. it out and get the best outcome totally and i also think that's got to be better for your mental health as well because it's too much you can't know everything about everything you know and so you know getting help from all the right places just really just so helpful isn't it so um i mean you certainly see that when you're chatting on the veterinary forums you know one vet says something and then all the other vets have all got their ideas and actually you can get all these plethora of ideas because they've come from so many different people um mm. which is really lovely so yeah definitely it, I just think it's got to be better for your mind because, yeah, it's got to be so stressful when you feel so much pressure to fix everything yourself, for sure, definitely. Um, Paula has jumped on again and she has said, um, it's great to hear vets wanting to use physio and acupuncture rather than drugs. Thumbs up. Absolutely. You, Paula. Thumbs up. No, definitely. Definitely. And I think, you know, it's, it's um, Again, I think on that whole, I have to fix everything as a vet, it's that responsibility of, you know, I have to find something and I have to give something um, in every consultation. You know, you really don't. It's having the confidence in knowing, you know, it, it, that you may not be able to have found what's wrong um, and, and knowing that maybe it doesn't, the answer is not in the end of a bottle or the end of a needle, um, that there's lots of other ways of managing these things. And sometimes, you know, no treatment is absolutely the best option totally it's all about having a discussion isn't it and and having mm. a joint discussion you know mutually between owner and vet as well and um and just you know coming to it together is absolutely yeah. fine and yeah. um and totally right i mean I, you know sometimes i say to people you know i'm just not sure yet let's you know let's work towards this and you know mm. and you come you get better ideas as you're going along and working through a problem but you don't have the instant answer straight away and that's no. not a problem as long as you're honest and you you yeah. sort of explain the journey of where you've come from where you've got to why you're thinking this and yeah it's it's I think um, as long as you're confident in that honesty so that it doesn't look like you know well she had no flipping clue what she was talking about <laughs> that's true so, and I have to say and I it's, think it's the, yeah it's the communication and, and making them aware and you know I think sometimes I'm probably um, a little bit guilty of giving people too much information but I think in this day and age as well actually it's better that they get that information from me than go home half confused and google search it and you know, maybe get the wrong end of the stick or you know and I can even guide them and say look you know if you want to go and read more then these are the really good websites to go to where you're going to get you know much more um you know sort of honest um advice and information um for sure yeah the and I definitely think that's that is definitely one bit that's on that's a bonus of age is that you do feel more confident in you know yeah. having those conversations and feeling okay mm -hmm. with not knowing everything mm -hmm. you're more okay with not knowing everything when you because you understand everything so much yeah. more that you're you're com you're you just confident and calm mm -hmm. so um yeah that's it's you know very, very interesting and very honest of you joe so thank you very much <laughs> and mm -hmm. i you know hope other vets are listening and also feel good about that comment as well because I know that other vets do watch this and um you know because yeah. it helped them to feel good and calm about situations as well which is lovely yeah. so um I'm going to go back to um finding out some more about you um I wanted to ask you what is the weirdest dream you've ever had that's a tough one isn't it <laughs> you're thinking why did I last sleep <laughs> Oh my God. Do you know, I, I always really disappointed that I don't remember very many of my dreams. Aww. And I suppose the weirdest ones, I'm a little bit prone to like jumping out of bed in the middle of the night um, and and like screaming and, and shouting. And my husband literally has to wake me up and calm me down. Um, and there was oh one where God. I thought that my son was in the corner of the room and he was going to jump and I had to catch him. And I literally was like standing on my <laughs> trying to catch my son. 
Oh my God. Unaware. And I'm assuming you know, I had no idea what I was saying. So it's not really a dream, was it? But it kind of was because I was asleep. Yeah, that it yeah. was a dream. Your son wasn't actually there, right? He wasn't. He wasn't actually on the ceiling. That's all. As a baby, it's a bit, yeah, yeah, slightly odd. It's all right. It's why I like asking the question because it blows my mind. So I'm a bit <laughs> like, okay. I have no idea what to think about that particular one. I mean, yeah. I'm pretty sure that sounds like some weird dodgy horror movie, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, no, no. I think, ceiling. wasn't it Train Spotting, where there was a baby crawling across the ceiling? That's it, yeah. Mm. Oh, wow. And yeah. that's what you've taken from that film. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. that's horrible. Yeah. yeah. Poor you. Wow, I wouldn't <laughs> want to remember those either. I think it was my husband, girl. actually. I was fine. <laughs> he was just like, Jesus, woman. Standing on top you of you suffer head. night terrors. Um, no, I mean it doesn't happen very often. It, you know, it's just every now and then. I don't, I don't think I, I don't sleepwalk or anything like that. It just, okay. yeah, it's just, it's obviously those, and I think it is, it's those, you know, like really vivid, very um, frightening, very instant, very. It's, it's not like a wonderful long drawn out dream. It's just like a real quick three second, like you know, oh my god, someone's about to be hit by a car, and I have to pull them out of the way, and it wakes you up because you've flung yourself across the room. I do the falling thing quite a lot. That's, ugh. yeah, that's horrible. Oh, wow. Yeah. Whew, that's going to, yeah. Oh, I hope you don't go and do dreaming about that tonight now, just because we've talked I know, about I just it. don't want anyone analysing this and telling me what it means. I'm I don't like, think anyone could analyse that, if I'm honest. <laughs> I'm not sure there's a lot to come from that. Child on the ceiling, like you say, that's train spotting. I'm just like, I, I just, I feel for you because that must have been exhausting. <laughs> Blimey. So um, if you could treat any zoo animal, what would it be? And I'm going to say, let's remove your orangutans because that's what your favourite is. It is. Um, do you know what? I just went to Longley Safari Park. Um, oh, something's gone a bit peculiar there. Um, I went to Longleat Safari Park with my daughter the other week, and for the first time in my life ever, I saw an aardvark. Oh, oh wow! It's like my new favourite animal. I oh, thought they wow. looked really cool. Yeah, really, really cool. Oh, but, lovely. Um, the other things that I have actually physically treated, um, there's been bears. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, so moon bears over in China, pretty cool so taken from bio farms and having um you know yeah, their, that's what you meant is their gallbladders removed um yes. I quite like working with um with penguins i was down in south africa for a massive oil spill called the treasure oil spill um in 2000 um working with african penguins they were really quite cool um, they are very so cool all of the primates really gorillas are awesome um as well big soft spot for me to do. That's very cool. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. So what's the most memorable part of your career so far? The orangutans. <laughs> do you know, um, well, the job that I had with I4 took me to some, um, just some amazing projects. So when I, when I first started working for them, I was the first vet that they'd employed and they had, um, so I was brought into what, was uh, developing emergency relief team so that was oil spill response and marine mammal strandings but also my job was um to just kind of oversee from a veterinary perspective any of the projects that i4 were investing in where wildlife was impacted by wildlife and brought into um was brought into captivity for a period of time whether that was for 24 hours or whether that was for 25 years um so they, you know, in, invested money in lots of projects and projects were always um, approaching them and asking for, for sponsorship. And they just wanted to make sure that, it, that the, the projects were actually being run in a really good way. Um, so I literally spent three years traveling the world looking at all the projects that they had put money into. Wow. Um, and there's some, yeah, there were some really, really, really amazing, memorable um, projects. And I think that Daphne Sheldrick's elephants in Kenya were phenomenal um where they just you know have all these orphaned elephants where maybe mum's being poached or their baby's got you know separated for some reason and they would just reset up matriarchal groups and eventually just 
you know, soft release them back into national parks. You know, they would go out as this, um, you know, all, all of them were orphans and eventually, you know, someday just some of them just don't come back and they found their way into the wild herds and stuff. With, yeah, it was amazing. And there's another one in Russia, Pajetnov's bears, again, you know, orphaned cubs that were reared by this chap and his um, wife and son um, with the hope of, of releasing. And they were releasing European black bears back into national parks really successfully. Um, so it was very remote um, handling that they did with them. They you know, completely covered up all the time. So there was no sort of human smell. There was very little contact. They had just a phenomenal setup um, and yeah. it, just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant work. It's I mean, it's hard because, you know, as a, as a vet, there's not much clinical stuff really going on, I guess, with a lot of these conservation and rehab projects. Um, but, yeah, just amazing memories because they were just brilliant grassroots projects. That's amazing. Mm. So before we wrap up, what I would like to know is what is your top tip for dealing with pain? <sighs> is that one size doesn't fix all that pain is very individual um, and you usually need to have lots of different modalities to help it. So that's weight loss and really looking at your environment and your slippy floors and whether the bed is the right place for them to be getting in and out of, to your exercise regimes, to, you know, looking at whether you're, you know, throwing lots of balls or, you know, going through hills or steps or warming up before you go off lead to, medication to acupuncture to physiotherapy to hydrotherapy you know and it is I think it's genuinely different for every single animal and I think it shouldn't be rushed in the conversations that as a vet you're having with um, your clients when you're really just trying to manage the best outcome for um, usually the, the dog um, it's you know it's not as easy to be as intense with with cats quite so much you know they're very independent do their own thing it's not quite so easy really to manage um their lifestyles etc but we can still you know put a fair amount of input into that absolutely so that's a great tip is basically review everything at the point of pain and see what you can you know figure out where you can help it because it evolves as well doesn't it as the pain evolves things change so what's all right for one moment isn't good for the next yeah. Paula, thank you so much for watching and for getting involved. And Paula has just added <laughs> slippery falls, the bane of my bank account. Yes, they are. Paula's dog has been through so much. Um, oh. And this is why this is why we know Paula and we love Lily. Um, but bless her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Slippery floors. Not fun for anybody. Well yeah. done adding that, Paula. It's a very good life <laughs> lesson. I know. I have floors for paws in my house and I, I do plug it frequently because... It's actually amazing if you are going to go hard, but oh my goodness me. Yeah, it's it's insane how much difference it makes, isn't it? So, yeah. um, Joe, it has been absolutely amazing talking to you. It's been wonderful. You have blown my mind. You're a really inspiring person. I did not expect to be talking to a record holding, rowing Olympian oh. potential hard-ass walker <laughs> um, who'd done veterinary all over the globe with all sorts of species and loved having an orangutan stuck to her leg for uh, 10 days. So, um, yeah, it's been really great to get to know you. So thank you so much for joining Absolute us. Pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. <laughs> and, um, yes, and for our cup of tea. Thank you, everyone, for watching. It's been really great. I really appreciate my audience. Love to you all. And I will see you again in two weeks for our next cup of tea with the vet. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.